So um, I just want to start off by um, summarising really what I took from the panel today. Um, first of all, we had Joe, who talked about if you want to beat Amazon in the search rankings, specialise. So try and be a specialist, an expert in your area, and get those niche terms. And then we had Callum, who talked about choosing whether you're going to be a brand and uh, you know, go down the route of Nike or whether actually if you're a big site, maybe you're a marketplace. Uh, or if you're somewhere in between, which strategy do you want to look at? And how do you build out your technology around that? And then Rebecca looking at you know, a company who we would all consider to be a very big brand, a very well-known brand. But even for a company like John Lewis, perhaps it isn't just as simple as relying on brand power to do well in a changing search landscape. And we are joined now uh, as well, uh, and you better get used to this if you're going to any events over the next month or two, I think, uh, via TeleLink um, uh, from Milton Keynes. Milton Keynes, this is London calling. Hello, Milton Keynes. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> What's the score out of 10, Dan? <laughs> Very good. So Dan is head of natural search at Argos. Um, and as the other speakers have all been speaking for a little bit, I'm going to go to you, Dan, first, if that's OK, and ask you a question. Argos is a big site. It's a big brand. Um, in terms of that thing between specialising and brand and you know, embracing marketplaces, perhaps even being a marketplace as a retailer, which way is Argos facing? What are Argos? Well, I mean, it's a good question, James. I think the thing there is, I guess, we're in a fortunate position where we've built up our brand over 50 years now, and have got a strong high street presence. So the, the lure of the marketplace, perhaps less so, I mean, Argos does have a, an offering on eBay. Um, we're not on Amazon. Um, I'm not aware of any plans to, to go down that route, um, and from my own my own point of view, it's not a route I'd want to go down either. I think, you know, specialism is a, is a great route to go down. We're seeing a lot of that within retail, a lot of, um, sort of specialist vertical disruptors. But the thing for me is about going, it's also about specialising in why should, specialising in why should someone come to you or your brand? Um, not necessarily because of a particular product set, but because of your service offering or convenience, that sort of thing. Um, Rebecca, you had a oh, I've dropped all my cards. That's useful. Uh, Rebecca, you had a perspective on this. Before we come to you, and just you know, you can elaborate a little bit on where you think John Lewis might be going in that. Um, just get a poll of who's in the audience a little bit, so we can kind of tailor it to that. So, who in the audience, if you could put your hands up, would consider themselves a brand, um, really focusing on brand? So, there's a few hands there, about a third. And who who would consider themselves a retailer primarily? In there? Two or three, a few there. And anybody from marketplaces, anyone consider themselves a super site? Is that train line at the back there? Yeah, OK. Brilliant. So we've got a bit of a mix in the room of different kind of people. You know, in terms of this uh, you know, balance between marketplaces, specialising as a brand, you know, what do you think the challenge is for John Lewis? Where do you think they're going to be going with this? My Britney moment. Um, yeah. I think for, for John Lewis, I think probably our biggest challenge is actually our brand perception and who our brand is for. So I think actually part of our strategy is trying to alter that. So away potentially from the very affluent sort of middle aged demographic and actually in becoming much more of an inspirational place that broadens their reach, I guess, akin to Boohoo, where they're sort of taking on the likes of Karen Millen and Coast. We're probably just trying to do the inverse. So I don't I think we're probably in agreement with our boss that Amazon isn't necessarily our main route yet. I think we probably have other challenges to counter first in order to ensure growth. Joe, is there anything you want to add to that? Any thoughts about where brands should be going, what John Lewis should be thinking about? Um, I guess the, the thing for me would be, yeah, it's these, the bit that's probably the hardest place at the moment is the smaller retail sites, the big retail sites that are more um, department store type ones, because they are, in essence, a kind of mini marketplace already. And that's kind of what Amazon probably looked at and then went, we're going to do that online, and then kind of went <laughs> on another scale with it. Um, so I think that's probably the toughest thing. And you've got 
the, the real sweet point at the moment, I think, is if you're in retail, but as a very specific brand within retail, that's where you can kind of start to make your own moves, I think, definitely, because you can do that everywhere. You could do that on Amazon if you want to do it. You could do it on eBay if you want to do it. You can do it on Google. You can do it everywhere. And like you said, you can build up your following. It's Instagram, it's Facebook, it's everywhere. And Callum, um, we heard earlier you saying that Limworks help brands get go direct to consumer, work through platforms. Uh, one of the questions we had back before the event um, through the survey was how do brands go about controlling that brand experience when they're giving away that control of that to platforms such as Amazon and, and the like? So there are ways that which they can yeah, do that? I, I, so yeah, I think it's really important for brands that they uh, are really clear on that because it's such an important thing, like owning your brand and keeping it consistent across the internet is super important if you really want to build that community. So. I think uh, it really leads back to the kind of example Nike gave. So what they've done is they've worked with marketplaces like Zalando, for example. So they've actively embraced that marketplace where they've essentially said that marketplace aligns with our four principles and therefore we can sell on it because that's actually a place that's enhancing our brand. Whereas Amazon is somewhere that uh, we simply don't believe we're getting brand differentiation. Therefore, we don't want to sell uh, on that channel. And so they're just being really clear around which channels they're willing to utilize and which they're not. And Rebecca, social, um, selling in social. So you've all had Pinterest are trying to monetize. Um, you've got Instagram where you can begin to do retail in Instagram. Is that perhaps an opportunity for brands, you know, to uh, still go direct to consumer, but also create a bit more of a richer brand experience? I think we're actually doing a test with um, Pinterest. I don't necessarily know from a selling perspective, but mm. actually sort of starting to use Pinterest in more. Um, interesting ways. I'm probably not the best place to answer. We don't necessarily actually work as closely with social as we possibly should be and that's something which um, I guess that's probably also true for a big, big retailer. Actually a lot of these teams do work in fairly, I hate to use the word siloed because it's been around for years, um, but I think it, that is actually quite true somewhere like John Lewis, so actually tying everything up together is probably where we need to, to start um, before I think thinking about a marketplace. Mm -hmm. Dan, just on that note, you know, Argos, a big retailer, you've, um, over the last few years with us, a lot of big projects, transformational projects, bringing in uh, a lot of different stakeholders. As, as a, a, a you know, head of organic search, what kind of conversations are you having and what kind of stats and things are you doing to try and uh, persuade and win over people in the business uh, to different strategic thinking? Well... For me, it's quite simple. It, it all comes down to commercials, commercial thinking. You know, ultimately, the aim of any business is to be generating revenue. Yeah, a big part of that is how you look after your customers, turning up where they are, and dealing with them in the way that you expect. But uh, to get any proposal, any campaign across, it's about a understanding that that's important to your customers, and b that's going to be revenue driving or can be tested. Um, you know, the economy continues to be a challenge, retail continues to be under pressure, so ROI and thinking very carefully about where you invest every pound becomes arguably more important than ever. And are there ways that you're um, changing the way you operate as a team to, uh, you know, adapt to the changing uh, landscape? Um, I mean, I think it's just that continued evolution of get smart about how to talk to people about these things. Um, as an industry, um, SEO has spent a lot of time talking a lot of nonsense and continuing to get smarter on how you talk to people about it, how you address, address the room, whether they're bought into it, high skilled, low skilled or not, becomes really important. So both myself as a leader and each of my team members, regardless of the level of experience, it's, it becomes more and more about how we discuss what we do and making sure that essentially we are talking nonsense. Joe, one of the things that we're doing at Organic with clients is around empowerment. So essentially outsourcing some of the doing around knowing how to put together good content, expertise content and those things, and skilling up the wider business. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the reason for that and why it has an impact? Yeah, so I, I guess there's, there's two parts to the empowerment bit, I suppose. You've got the, the first part is at the end of the day, every SEO team is stretched because there is so much to do all the time. And so one of the things that you don't want to have to do all the time is answer 
some fairly basic questions over and over again. So if you can get uh, your content teams, you can get your social teams, you can get your pay teams to understand the SEO thing, then they can a lot of the time start running with that themselves and there's less of those base questions. You can work on the bigger strategy, you can work on what you need to be doing. And then the second part is sort of doing that training around the business, sort of SEO training around the business, it helps to get other parts of the business excited about SEO and kind of understand it, get bought into it. And then you've got advocates for it within kind of all of the different departments. And we, we can hope, especially in Argos, we hope at the moment we've probably got five or six, seven really key people in big departments that are really invested in the SEO world now. And so they shout our horn for us and we're never the last ones into a meeting anymore. We can, you know, we're invited in straight away. Whereas, you know, a few years back when it was always just SEO was the no guy. So you don't want to be that. But yeah, it's, it's been really helpful. I couldn't agree with Joe Moore on that. You know, SEO isn't won or lost in isolation. Um, if you think your organic success is about your organic team alone, you're doing it wrong. So bringing a, a digital team with you, an e-commerce function with you, to make sure that everyone actually understands they've got a vested stake in this and they contribute to the successful failure is, is critical. Uh, Rebecca, you talked about um, PPC and SEO working together a little bit, um, and hybrid search strategy is something that we're using a lot at the moment. So what, what successes and maybe challenges have you faced internally in terms of stakeholder engagement, getting people on side, getting to work together? Um, well, I think probably true for a lot of big companies, SEO is the biggest channel of traffic. So almost discussing how to get people on site, it is intrinsically the most important channel. So I don't think these days the challenge is recruiting people to sort of our way of thinking. It needs to be and it is becoming more part of just general strategy. Um, I guess sort of akin to what you've been saying at Argos, we have upskilled a lot of people within the team, but equally people are coming to us as much as we are going to them, um, especially as the challenge is sort of much more multifaceted than an SEO challenge, a PPC challenge. It's a proposition challenge. It's a service challenge. Mm. And actually, I think as SEO evolves and changes, our team are now essentially becoming, I guess, sort of expert market researchers as opposed to just sort of tech SEOs or content SEOs or outreach SEOs. We know a huge amount about sort of the marketplace um, and how people are changing. So I think we're becoming or have already possibly become an incredibly important sort of chair at the table just on the basis of the fact that we are the strongest channel. We do know a lot and actually given the challenges that we have in terms of, especially with John Lewis, a declining interest in brand, we have to be the ones that are thinking of slightly more novel strategies. So it's that role for the SEO as the technical experts, understanding the ecosystem, understanding how all the algorithms and that work and kind of bringing that to bear across all of the channels and all of the brands. Um, we talked a bit about big companies. There are small companies in the room as well. So just back to you, Joe. Obviously, it's all very well, you know, to say, uh, and you know, Callum as well, to talk about building multiple channels, having teams, collaborating, and all of this capability in large organisations. There are businesses in this room I know with like one employee at the moment. So, um, as a smaller team or as a smaller firm, how do you address these challenges versus huge super sites specialising and, and, and looking at that? Um, so yeah, I, I would I would say it's the same as what I was talking about in my talk, really. You need to find what you need to go after and be sensible with your priorities for the year, I guess, um, and realize that you're not going to be going and winning everything straight away and, and work on a particular aspect first and really get to know that, understand that, win that. Then once you do that, start building out onto the next step and still building out onto the next step. It's, um, it's, it's all about understanding your market and understanding your users, knowing what because you've got users, you know what your users, who your users are anyway, you need to figure out where they're actually shopping, what they're doing. Because it might be that a lot of the time, the organic space is one of the better spaces to be, but you might be selling something that actually people never, they just go straight to Amazon every single time. And in which case, you're probably going to have to look there. So you're talking about being customer-centric, 
really understanding the behaviors and what drives your customer, you know, really getting that bit right. People-centric thinking before you get to the tech center doing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, um, Callum, um, just before we go to the audience, and I'll be coming to you in just a minute, um, one last question. Um, you guys are a tech platform. Um, uh, tools, technology is a massive part of this, you know, uh, at the moment, getting the right infrastructure in place. Uh, what kind of technologies do we need to be thinking about? And how is that landscape going to be changing? We've got voice, you know. We've got uh, multiple vertical search. We've got all of these platforms coming along. We've got headless CMS. We've got this idea of being able to sell straight into social or into the operating system on your phone. So how, 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 what do brands, large and small, need to be thinking about in terms of technology? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, this slightly biased view, obviously, on our product. But I think, you know, the, the problem that we ultimately solve is the problem that the market is shifting and changing. So what we're seeing is Facebook, Instagram, coming into that marketplace space. Walmart have done it, Best Buy, Target. There's so much movement in that direction. The market is shifting. So I think the key thing for anybody who's selling online in a brand is how do you build agility into your tech stack? How do you make sure that you can track with the market? Because you don't want to, and again, this is why I think a product similar to ours or ours is important, is that you don't only, you don't build all your operational capability in the back end of your website. Because what that will ultimately do is the website wants you everything to go through there, right? So you need to decouple those things so that you have a website and that should be a key channel for your brand. But you should never limit yourself to that. You need to have a, a sort of an agility to basically make sure your products are available where your target customer chooses to shop. That might be Amazon. Some people just love Amazon, but equally it could be a Zalando, it could be a Wayfair, wherever you're choosing to sell. So I think that piece is important. And then I think um, the other piece is, of course, if you are developing your own website, using technology that is going to build, uh, allow you to build a brilliant experience on the front end with consumers. So at the end of the day, consumers have so much choice that if you don't deliver a great buying, shopping experience, super frictionless, they're just going to go somewhere else. So I think, uh, you know, certainly on that front end, the way that you engage with consumers becomes extremely important as well. So you're talking about, first and foremost, you know, getting that bit where you manage all your content and all your data and all your product, all your fulfillment and distribution, that kind of built as a standalone thing. Yeah. So essentially, you can pop front ends on from the customer exactly. wherever and yeah. however, the, and change them quickly. Yeah. You know, you talk about, um, Rebecca, the rise of creating a richer brand experience. You talk about specialist content, Joe. The ability to go from being a very e-commerce, directory-heavy site, maybe to quite a content-rich site fairly quickly as an approach. Um, over to you, Dan, on that. Um, I'll go I was going to say, yeah. I was keen to jump in on that perspective of, actually, there are, there are simple ways of doing this as well, depending on the scale of your brand. So I've been talking to a lot of uh, micro sellers recently and tools like Shopify for example are making that inventory management um, really simple so not having to invest in tons of extra tech to be able to manage your website inventory versus what you might put out on, um, on the marketplace so I completely agree with what's being said around trying to decouple that experience and remove that friction in your technology I think the thing that's been able to take away is that it doesn't have to be scary it doesn't have to be a huge investment. You appreciate Shopify is at the complete other end of the potentially of the marketplace, but there are some really key technological solutions in that space to help people turn up where they need to. And sometimes, Dan, the tools you need may be not out there. So in the marketplace, so I know we've been helping you guys develop a tool to help with uh, across the Sainsbury's group, in particular within Argos. You know, what's the thinking behind that? Are you investing more in tools and tech? And, and for what reasons? Yeah, I mean, so for, for us, we've taken the view that says, you know, we, see, we're a huge brand in the UK. The only brands bigger than us in the digital space are the likes of Amazon and eBay, who are so big, they're not really thinking about what we're doing. But the rest of the marketplace, we're a big fish that they can go, potentially go after if they're serving sort of broad, GM product. So for us, we have taken that view that to protect the share we've got to continue to serve customers, we need to stay ahead of the market from an insight point of view. So not just relying on what's coming out from industry chatter or from enterprise tech platforms, but really trying to wrangle what that data means for us. Now, 
the approach we're taking, yeah, is looking at some bespoke options because that's the right thing for us to do. But I think across um, e-commerce, across retail, the key thing there is taking as much responsibility for your data as you can and really learn what it's telling you. Um, you know, that's not necessarily something particularly unique or revealing, but bloody hell, it makes all the difference. And we want to pick up on the data point because that's very important. So I guess, so just to kind of go on a bit from what Dan's talking about there is, so the tooling that we're trying to help build with them at the moment, um, so one small part of it, there's, there's a lot of facets to it that I'll let Dan talk about if he wants to, he might not want to, but one, one small part of it is, a, <laughs> one small part of it is obviously things like your basic keyword research. So where I've been talking around, you really need to understand your specific areas and stuff. For someone like Argos, that specific area is pretty big. And so keyword research is always something that's quite hard to do on that kind of scale, especially you can do your top level bit. And then when you try and dig down into it, you'd need thousands of people constantly going over stuff like that. So we've been trying to create tools that work around that, that we can maybe build in some artificial intelligence that can help us do that on mass in a much better way than just getting a thousand bums on seats to click away. So I'm aware data's massive, you know, there's issues around cookie permissioning, there's whole ethical issues around that as well, but I want to throw things over to you guys now to ask your questions of the experts. So the guys are going around with microphones. If anyone would like to put their hand up, uh, Hello, what's your name and where are you from? Warren from Limworks. Um, this is, I guess, a question for Rebecca and Dan. How have you guys viewed Google's move, move into checkout? So obviously, the, last year, they moved checkout into France, so people would check out through Google. You, you, you positioned Google as a bit of a competitor yourself. How did you view that move? And that, obviously, that coming to the UK this year, that's going to be, make, you know, big changes to, to shopping and, and, and checking. Dan, did you get that? Uh, was that about Google checkout experiences? Yeah, Google, was, Google was shopping. Was, so was there a specific angle, sorry? Yeah, just how, 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 as a retailer, how did you view that? Um, as someone who guess has been doing this a while, unsurprising. Um, I think, you know, if you go back a decade, well not even quite a decade, Google were talking about shifting people on as quickly as they could, and then very quickly it became keeping people within the Google experience, and that's the route that they've been going down for the last five years or so, so it's not particularly a surprise for me. I think, you know, as a retailer, you know, I've got my own personal views on it, um, but for brands, I think there's obviously a lot of opportunity there because people have that trust. I think it's comes back to being an inventory management to make sure that you can um, continue to, to sell or maybe take advantage of that. But equally, it comes back to what is someone buying from you? You know, if you're the cheapest in the market, which chances are you're not, that's not really the reason for you to exist as a brand and a, as a retailer. So investing in those experiences being, it, it comes back to you taking Google's own terminology and throwing it back at them giving that most authoritative answer, actually helping a user on that nuance that they care about. So you know, Google's going to do what it's going to do, um, and it'd be easy for me to get in dick and irate about that, but it's it's the landscape which you're working from. And uh, you know, as a large provider of our organic traffic, they don't, still don't actually owe us anything. Um, so for me, I. I just kind of try and get on with what I'm trying to do, which is make sure our website is discoverable and meaningful and keep going from there. Rebecca. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd probably reiterate. Um, I'd also say that we're not the only industry to bemoan Google's oh. proliferation of products. Expedia cited Google Hotels within their end of year results as part of the factors as why they sort of got a slightly softer performance than they were expecting. So yeah, absolutely not. Um, I guess sort of an unexpected move from them, and I think we already do view them very much as a competitor. Um, as a brand that I think has enough challenges possibly 
at the moment already. Mm. Um, I don't think it's necessarily something which is going to become our focus at the moment. Um, I think probably our biggest tech one is probably speed, like a lot of other sites are probably seeing. So I think um, ensuring that John Lewis themselves are a sort of frictionless shopping site is probably where we are focusing the majority of, of our effort at the moment, allowing Google to continue to um, dominate as much as they want and maintain people within Google. But we, I don't think, can become too distracted by that. We obviously need to be aware of what their strategy is, but ultimately need to understand what our strategy is as well, rather than just sort of like okay. being a bit of a sheep. Callum, you've got a point. Yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, ultimately what's happening with Google is Amazon are going to top a funnel and offering paid search opportunities to Amazon and, and Google are trying to go down the funnel and basically keep you in their platform. So I think it's just a continuation of what's happening, which is marketplaces are ultimately trying to own top to bottom in the funnel, become really good at engaging consumers and therefore brands, again, I think just have to figure out how do you work from my perspective. If you're not taking them on, then how do you begin to work with them and how do you say, okay, well, people are going to be on Google, they're shopping there. How do we have a really good strategy for that, as we do with Facebook, as we do with Amazon, dot, dot, dot. So I'm going to ask the audience now a little bit. We'll take a little poll on your views on Google, threat, foe, or friend. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, do you think Google is your friend and is going to be someone you need to work with, an ally to help your brand? Or do you think they're a threat to your brand and to your platform? So all of those of you who think that Google is a threat, if you put your hands up now, one, two, three, four. Interesting. And how many do you think Google is a friend, someone they've got to work with? So the majority, the majority think Google is a friend. Well, I guess if you get a load of people talking about SEO in a room, um, uh, they're going to be pretty uh, you know, aligned with Google to some extent. Um, back to the room then. Uh, any other questions? Anthony, I know you had a question. Uh, <laughs> Anthony is from a company called Twindig, which is a property platform, um, uh, investment-backed startup. Um, you had some questions about, you know, what, where, what, how uh, platforms work and so on. Do you want to maybe answer that? Can you remember what it was? I, I had several, which I thought were controversial, but I thought I'll let you choose. <laughs> So um, one of them was around, okay, so this is an interesting one. So one of the things Anthony asked about was around customer place, uh, sorry, marketplaces um, actually being the customer and who you work to. So he said, should we be optimizing and focusing on treating marketplaces and sites like Google uh, and, and working to please them or as, as they are actually the real customer, they determine our success or not? So, or should, should we not be doing that? Um, I, I have some ideas in which some of the views of the panel will go. Um, but how about we start with Joe on this one? Yeah, so um, I guess the good thing, so from an SEO point of view and with Google, I guess the good thing with Google is as they are becoming more and more intelligent and being able to understand things, they are essentially becoming the same as a user. So they're the same as your end customer and they just want to know the best things to go to essentially and so it is getting a lot easier to treat your yeah your end user as the same thing you've got your customer that buys something but you've also got google and they're both just your user whereas back in the day when you used to maybe do a few separate things where you might be trying to game google a bit more i definitely didn't do that sort of stuff but <laughs> that's what people in seo did and so but now it's the same. Google and customers are the same thing, essentially, and that's what we work to. It is that customer-centric focus on things. So you, you say gaming the platform, so creating thousands of links in your footer that are the same color of the page or gateway pages, that stuff just isn't going to work anymore. You've got to really work with them and try and be customer-centric. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. They, they are just as intelligent as people looking at the site themselves now, I would say. So. Rebecca? I mean, that seems like a glib answer but yes obviously they are as important as consumers are so I don't think that probably needs to be labored too much yeah. they are obviously the one that rule us so yes. and do you think we should be optimizing for what you know for that algorithm or do you think we should be focusing on the customer experience could you talk about brand the importance of brand you know that's quite an emotional irrational thing to engage with very hard to put in an algorithm so but I think what Google is becoming is essentially 
probably the most smart shopper out there. They want to see fairly sort of humanistic um, approaches to marketing and to site taxonomy. They're not necessarily asking for something which is a bit left field. They're asking mm. for the most sort of seamless of experiences um, that probably do have a point of view. I mean, they want authority, they want trust. So I think they're probably a human, but with the most sort of logical brain on top. Callum. Yeah, maybe as moving away from Google, I think in terms of thinking of marketplace as, as a sort of customer, so Amazon, for example, has a vendor. Uh, if you're familiar with Amazon, they've got Vendor Central, so where you can basically treat them like a wholesale customer. So you can actually sell product to Amazon and they, they then sell that product on and take the risk and the stock. But actually, increasingly, their business is shifting towards being a, a partner rather than a customer. So uh, last year, it was 58% of their business of that volume is actually third party and they're looking to grow that and ultimately you know, shifting more and more towards that pure play. So I think increasingly from, you know, from a kind of retail marketplace sort of environment, I think uh, these platforms ultimately, if whether it's Amazon or a Walmart, they're becoming search environments uh, which you can partner with to make, make sure your product gets discovered on those platforms rather than somebody who's gonna buy product from you and sell it on. And Dan, have you got a perspective on this? Yeah, I mean, there's one thing that, that you said to James around should be optimising for customers or algorithms going, if I'm honest, that it's an options point. Um, the algorithms are trying to replicate what customers care about. All that is to customers. So they're, they're one and the same. Now, the algorithms to appear on marketplaces like Amazon, you see people just putting utter nonsense in page titles, and I can see why that would be. If you're trying to that's your main route to market, why well, you may want to optimise to play that game. But at the end of the day, at some point, Amazon's going to get smarter, like Google's done over the years, mm. to realise that that stuff is just spammy, it's crap, it's not helping the customer. Um, and look, there, there are two things, the two reasons why you're in business. One is to serve people, and two is to make money from that. Now, if you focus, if you get the balance of that wrong, you're always going to be just trying the cheapest maneuver you can get put yourself in front of people and that's never going to be the route to long term success. Um, we need to stop splitting SEO and customer. We need to stop talking about Google specifically, Amazon specifically. They are mm. uh, they're the keepers of the rules a lot of it, but at the end of the day it's about engaging with people. It's always been about engaging with people. Um, and just we need to keep this real simple for ourselves. Be the best answers. If you want the best answer, why should someone come to you? Um, I know for I know I'm speaking from a position of strength coming from a large brand, but that principle is the same. What is your route to your customer? Why why should anybody care about what you're doing? Um, and I think you just need to keep asking yourself that. Um, because if you want to go onto the Amazon marketplace and put every flipping of keywords you can in a product title, then great, good luck to you. You might make some money, but you're not going to build a brand. Um, I'm not saying that's a problem, I'm just saying you just got to keep in respect of what's mm. people, depending on the route you take to market. And um, yeah, uh, sorry, I'm just doing a bit to you about that. Because... No, not at all. I think it's a very good point to be wrapping things up on. <laughs> That's an even better point to, to be wrapping things up on, Dan. Um, uh, you know, keep it simple and don't talk shit. Sounds sensible. Um, thank you ever so much to all our panellists and speakers. Uh, to Rebecca, thank you very much. To Callum, to Joe, and to Dan. Um, I'm really sorry I could be there, by the way. It would be so much more amusing if was. <laughs> Um, thank you to the audience as well for your contributions. 